uh, wonderful good morning as well. Uh, you realize that's a Christian practice that they, we have been practicing for 2,000 years already. Uh, the, the greet each other with a holy kiss. Right now, we're greeting each other with uh, holy good mornings. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, today's a special Sunday, as Faith said. We're not going to continue on with Matthew for this morning. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to do so next week. But this Sunday, we will be talking about how as a local church, GCAF, can prepare, can build for the next generation church. Listen, it has been said that today's decisions will determine who you'll be tomorrow. It has also been said that God has no grandchildren. God only has children. Be it when you are a senior, be it when you are a, a young person or a child, we are all children of God and everybody is precious and all of us have roles to live out for His glory. Now, there's a story of a small village in Africa wherein there was a young mother who lost her child while she was in a busy place and she was searching frantically for, this, for, for her child only to find her child to be safe because the village helped raise the child. They were protecting the child. They said they, they provided uh, shelter, they provided food for the lost child until she was found again by her young mother. And I think that is also one of the picture that if I were to ask you, dear brothers and sisters, what would you like GCAF to be in the next years to come? Psalm 78 will be our text for this morning. And it starts with it being described by the, the author who is Asaph as as a maskil. This is a, a maskil, and, and basically a maskil is a psalm intended, a song that is intended to teach, a song that is intended to give instruction. And where it's nothing new for us. When we were babies, our parents would sing us songs that were intended to teach us. And, and so even though we, we don't know how to talk yet, we don't know, you know uh, how to communicate uh, parents sung us like songs uh, such, such as uh, A, B, C, right? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And it's not, the song wasn't me me just meant to, be, to make you sleep. The song wasn't just meant to make you uh, soothing, uh, a soothing so sound and all, just to, to make you quiet. It was meant also to instruct. And so we have, we have one, little two, little three, and then we, we would have different songs that would teach different things. Now, a maskil is a song that they would teach history. The history or a lesson to point the people to God based on what they've gone through or their history. And so this is Asaph and he's writing a song meant to be sung regularly and it was a history. Their history, Israel's history meant to teach them about God and how they should respond to God. And so he says here, uh, may my Asaph, a uh, masculine of Asaph, my people hear my teaching. This is important. Listen to the words of my mouth. And they're singing this song, right? Imagine young or old, they're all singing this now. And so Asaph is now saying that I will, in verse 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. And so, he's saying here, I'm going to, the song is about to tell you a story. It'll tell you stories, actually. And this would be uh, stories of our past. And it will be very important for us, whoever's going to be singing the song in the next generations, to learn so that we would not repeat the mistakes of our ancestors. That means, because... 
if you remember who Asaph is, Asaph is a Levite. And a Levite, one of their role is to help in the temple. One of their role is to be uh, worship leaders. And they are instructing, part of the instruction, instructors now of a new generation. They're teaching the current generation a song so that they will be teaching this to the next generation. So what you're seeing here is a partnership at work wherein this is what would symbolize as a church right now, right? The church is to be seen as partners when reaching the next generation with, alongside families. Because it is very clear in the Word of God that fathers, mothers here in this room, you are given the mandate by God to teach your child about God. You are commanded by God to teach them. You cannot just relegate it and delegate it to other people. You must participate in doing so. But you are not alone. Because you see here in the story, in the song, that it is alongside the church. That you will be doing this together. Families alongside the spiritual family will be like that village that helped raise a child. That even though the mother lost her child for a while, the child was secured, sheltered, fed, even. To reach the next generation for the Lord, for us to be the church that would be ready to build towards reaching the next generation, both families and this local congregation that meets here has to work together. So we have a dream. And this dream will be realized only if we partner together. This dream is something for our children, for our grandchildren, and for their children and children to come. This is a dream worth having and worth sharing and worth living and worth sacrificing for. Psalm 28 would be the basis and our launching pad that before I will challenge us to participate in this dream that we have here in GCAF. Now, verse 4 is, a, is now a proclamation of Asaph. It says, this is the purpose of this song that will teach. This is the purpose of the, of the Psalm 78. And Psalm 78 is the second longest psalm, by the way. And he's saying here that the purpose of Psalm 78, the song that will teach and, and instruct the people, is to tell the next generation. To tell them how wonderful, how praiseworthy are the deeds of God. But here is the, the purpose. And you will later on, if you, if you read the whole of Psalm 78, don't forget this purpose that it's supposed to result in praise and glory and honoring God because what you will read later on would be shocking events. Huh, this really happened in, in their history? Wow, these people could do that? Wow, God did this? And, and you, you could easily lose track of the purpose of the psalm if you forget verse 4, that it is to be Godward, to praise God to remember his deeds, his power, and wonders that he has done. Now, this psalm is meant to instruct. And so, we have clues here. We can learn from this psalm how we can reach the next generation. Verse 3 says, This is a psalm that will teach you, but hey, this is not, nothing new. You've known this already. And so, you get a clue that this is not the first time through the song that they're hearing these instructions, these truths. This is a, 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 these are truths, history and all, that have been taught already in their temples, hence the, the church community, and their families. You see both at work here. They've been repeating this teaching again and again. And so that is number one, that how are we supposed to reach the next generation? 
we are supposed to teach the next generation through repetition all the stories of the Bible. And there's two groups here that would be involved, right? The one is the, the, the receiving end, right? The receiving group. And what's so commonly, uh, the common objection for this group is this. I've heard that so many times already. I'm sick of it. I'm fed up. I don't learn anything new. I know this already. I know this already. Stop repeating it, right? Uh, Dad, Mom, no, stop lecturing me. I know that already. <laughs> But you see, throughout history, repetition has been one of the most effective ways of teaching people. And you wonder why. Why do, why do we need to keep on repeating? Isn't it true that the moment you started listening this morning, to the message this morning, you wanted to listen, but after a few seconds, your mind starts to wander. Maybe some of you are in the beach already. Maybe some of you are up in the mountains. Maybe some of you are uptown or downtown. Some of your minds have wandered already. And so, if you notice that about yourself, when, you, when your mind starts to wander, you, you, when you pay attention again, you, you have missed out on many things, right? And, and you say, uh, can you repeat that again? <laughs> what did you say? And... and of course, the, 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 the speaker has to repeat it. And so we've been learning through repetition throughout all our lives because we easily get distracted. Not only do we get distracted, we easily forget. You get out from this room, how many percentage of what you will you remember? Very little. <laughs> so it bears... To repeat it, it pays off. And what is the message, by the way, of every Christian? It is the gospel, to, to preach the gospel to all the nations. That is a repetition of saying the message. What have you received? We have received through repetition the message. People repeating the message that they've received and pass it to others just as they have repeated and repeated and repeated until the Lord comes again. Second group here would be the ones that are, that are instructing. And, and one of the challenges is to give up and say, I'm tired of repeating myself. I'm tired of having to teach again and again to people that seems so hard to, to learn, that they can't seem to learn. And for teachers, for parents, for, for ministers, for every saint that is shepherding somebody right now, don't give up having to repeat yourselves or having to repeat instructions. Remember when once you were a baby, look at, just look at young children. You repeat things to them and they have no clue what you're saying. You sing ABCDs. They're not going to sing ABCDs with you for certain years, but there will come a day. As you sing your ABCD, they would go... go uh, a, B, and then they'll be singing along with you. There'll come a day. So don't give up repeating as well. It is uh, one of the things that God has given us, an effective way to reach the next generation. Verse 4 continues that Asaph says, we will not hide them from their descendants, what we have to say. We're going to be telling them Everything. We're not hiding. We're not going to hide anything. And the tendency to hide are the things that you don't normally want to talk about. That makes you uncomfortable. You know that dreaded conversation that you have to do have with your children. Many parents dread those moments when when the, the, the young child will ask a question that would make the parents squirm. Oh, this is the moment, right? But the psalmist said, "I'm not going to hide everything." anything. I'm going to teach you everything. Right? And we will tell the next generation. So, that means what are you aiming to teach counts. Do you have an aim in your teaching? Parents, Christians, when you are repeating 
and going out and sharing the gospel or raising a child or discipling somebody or being a disciple, walking in the Lord. And there are many areas in your life that's going on repeat. Many of the problems that you are facing right now, you're not, you're not, you haven't faced that just this time. It's been a repeating cycle. If you look at your life, you look at the problems you're encountering, and you would probably see a pattern that you've faced this problem and again and again. God is teaching you something. And as we can learn from that through the song as well, that what is your aim when you're teaching somebody? Because if you have no plans in teaching somebody, you're already teaching that person. You're teaching that person not to care. So everybody is a teacher in one way or another, be it through good or bad. Why should we reach and teach the next generation? Because it will result in praise towards God. It will result in them relying on His power and being amazed at his, the wonders that He's done. If you aim to teach by just imparting knowledge, you would, you would just teach it like this. You know what? God is praiseworthy. You know what? God's deeds are this. He saved the people in Israel. You know what? Uh, he died for our sins on the cross, rose on the third day, and these are the wonders He's done. He's healed people. He's, he's resurrected people from the dead. Do you now learn? Uh, have you learned that? Good. But if you're teaching in order to make them praise God and worship God, there's a whole world of difference. Because instead of saying that for knowledge's sake, you would be saying, you know what God did for my life, son? I was nothing. I was lost. I was dead. He found me in the, in the darkest place. He looked for me. And I can't in all of my life, I will serve Him. And I want you to, to serve with me because He's so good. Don't you see that in our lives? And what are you doing? Both are teaching, but one is teaching for information's sake, and the other is teaching to, for the praise of God and the glory of His name. What is your aim to teach? GCAF, what would we, we aim and how we would teach and reach the next generation? Let's aim for the praise and glory of His name. Because God has decreed in verse 5, God has decreed statutes for Jacob. He's established the law in Israel, meaning God has already given His word, His law, guidelines to live life to the fullest. You look back in your, as a parent, you look back as a child, what was the first thing you learned from your parent? What is the first thing you're teaching your child? No, don't do that. Oh, you can't go there. This is something you're not supposed to do. That's sharp. That's dangerous. You, are, you have been setting boundaries. You have been setting and decreeing established laws in your home. Why? So that the child can play and enjoy to the fullest, be safe at the same time. Because a child that is hurt is a child that won't enjoy life. So that's the same as God. And, and that's something that we have to teach now. You want to reach the next generation? Teach them to worship and praise God. Teach them to love His laws and decrees. To make them see that it is good. Because you yourself, you're loving it. And the result, the result of us doing that would be this. The next generation would know these wonderful words of God, the decrees, the established laws, and they would find it to be good coming from a trustworthy God, praiseworthy God. And, yet, and here's the thing. And they would tell the next, their children as well. Isn't that a picture of a, one generation passing on the love of God to another generation? And this next generation now would be reaching the next generation. Isn't that a dream worth having if that would be your child, 
your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew, your grandson. Growing up, praising and worshiping God with all His might. And them also reaching and teaching the same to their children. But it goes on. The wonderful things that will result in this is this. They would put their trust in God. One of the best things that you could do for you, uh, the next generation is to make them put their whole trust in God. Because then you would know that whatever happens in their life, they, are not, they can't be shaken. They will be standing on firm, solid ground while everything in this world is shaking. They, they would be firm. And they won't forget. They won't forget God and what He's done. How good, how gracious He is. And they will learn to keep and trust, trusting in Him and obeying Him no matter what the world will offer with their false promises of pleasure and delight. And they, finally in verse 8, won't follow the bad examples of their ancestors. Who are, they, who are their ancestors? The stubborn, rebellious generation. The ones who experienced the goodness of God, yet still chose to disobey and deny God. So the second way to do that, therefore, is this. And how we can reach the next generation. Teach the next generation to learn from both the positive positive. And the negative stories of the Bible. You can learn, and I learned this from my dad. He said, Dave, learn from the mistakes as well as what other people before you are doing right. So that both, in both cases, you can learn. And I've been doing that. Since I was a child, I'd look at my parents, I'd look at my uncles, I'd look at people around me, and I would take mental notes. I would look at uh, the way the family is being run and being handled, and i say, oh, this is nice. I'd, I'd like to do this for my family one day. Oh, this one, no. And, and so I've been learning through positive and negative examples as well. And that's when one way to make your children, the next generation, stable is to teach them everything about Scripture. Don't hide anything. Teach them all the, 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 the awful, tragic stories that happened. Teach them all the wonderful responses of faith or people as well that put their faith in God and make them learn through the positive and negative examples. And one of that story is here in 9 to 11. I'm not going to dwell on that for the sake of time. But basically, they turned their back. They did not keep God's covenant they refused to live by His laws, and they forgot what God had done for them. And that's why they lived that way. But here's one thing that I'd like to maybe dwell a little bit. One negative example for you, and one positive example, because this would have bearing with what we're going to do. Hezekiah. Hezekiah can be found, his story can be found in 2 Kings chapter 19, 20. And uh, in those chapters, Hezekiah started as a good king, by the way. And yet, there were moments in his life later on that he forgot. He forgot how God was so good to his life. He forgot how God delivered him and rescued him from dangers. And, and what he did was basically, at one point, he faced an army so big, he got so afraid, he said, uh, wait, sir, uh, let's, let's bargain don't attack my, my, my city. What, what can I do for us to be, have peace? And basically, the enemy king said, give me, give me money, lots of money. And Hezekiah, in his desperation, in him forgetting how God is so good and great, he can beat any army, he goes to the treasury of the temple, he takes the money that, is, that belongs to God, 
and gives it to the enemy king. He lost faith somewhere in his life. But God was so good and patient, God still was gracious to him. He healed Hezekiah from a dreadful disease. And at the later part of his life, and this is where we can learn from his example, the, the, what, the prophet approaches him and says, Hezekiah, there will come a day that the next generations that will come after you, they're going to be pillaged. They're going to be attacked. They're, they're gonna, their, their world is going to turn upside down. They're, they're going to lose everything. And this is what's so tragic with Hezekiah. His reply to his Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah was this. Whew, whew. That, that's, a, that's a relief. That message is good. Why did he say that? Didn't he just hear that his grandchildren, the next generation that will come after him, was going to lose everything? Because this is what he was thinking. At least, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. I'm safe. Woo! Thank you, Lord. It's their problem. We can easily fall in that track, right? trap, right? Now, where we might think we might have started well, but there might come a time that we would think, well, as long as I finish the race, the race of faith, I don't care what happens to everybody. I don't care what happens to the next generation. As long as I finish my race, as long as I take care of my family, my own kids, I don't care what happens to them. That's their problem. As long as I do what is right here for my own children, my own family. Learn from Hezekiah. This man lost his faith. This man lost his way. We can learn from the negative example of Hezekiah and learn instead of one positive example. David, King David. You know, at the end part of his life, David, who secured the kingdom already, said, I want to build a temple for you, God. I have a dream for you. I want to do something for you. I want to serve you and worship you. And, and he, he has a dream. He wants to build a temple for God. And yet, when God said to him, David, it's not going to be you. It's going to be the next generation that will have to do that. David's dream of building a temple for God, he instead embraced God's dream. He caught God's dream and he said, okay, okay, Lord. And this is a wonderful example. He said in First Chronicles 22.5, if it's going to be my next generation, if it's going to be my son, Solomon, and he looks at Solomon, he's so young right now, he's, he, he doesn't have the experience, he doesn't have the, the knowledge, I'm going to get ready. I'm going to get things ready for him. I'm going to help him. I'm going to build for the next generation. And that's why David was known to be a man of faith, a man of after God's own heart. And Hezekiah isn't. Both started well. But one man lost faith. The other remained firm in believing in God. It is every church duty, every family's duty to prepare for the next generation. We do it together. And we do it because we believe that we have an aim, a purpose in this life. Our purpose in this life doesn't stop with us receiving the blessings for ourselves, but to look and prepare the way for the next generation, just as the previous generation Christians gave blood, sweat, and tears in their lives for us to know the gospel, for us to be, to be taught. It is now our time to prepare and look ahead and prepare for the next generation of Christians. That's why the third lesson we can learn from, the, from this miscal is we can teach, we can reach the next generation if we teach them the whole awesome truth about God. We don't hold anything back. We don't say God is love, but then we hold his, his nature that He is also a jealous God, that He is a God that doesn't 
never tolerates be, having idols. He, he, he wants people to trust Him and obey Him. And, but we, we just highlight, okay? So we don't ever, we never ever want to teach by just highlighting one of His attributes at the expense of other attributes. We want to teach everything because this is God, who God is, the God of the Bible. And He's good. He's trustworthy. He's just. He is awesome. He's not a tame lion. And that way, it will result in the praise and glory of His name. The, the psalm goes on and it talks about how God is so faithful and loving even despite the forgetfulness and rebellion of the people. He, he guides them. He, he guided them. He, he's the one that created all these miracles in the wilderness and, and de delivered them. This is the, the retelling of the story of their miraculous escape from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. And here's the tragic reality. If, the, if the, a generation, one generation will come that will forget, that will not be taught by the previous generation, they will now forget and rebel. And God will judge them so that they will turn back to God. So that's one thing we have to teach. You know what? This psalm is also a warning. Warning. Don't, don't, don't follow the negative examples. Learn from them so that you yourself will not have to go through. But instead, experience the blessing of those who did trust God. And so, I'm going to pass out quickly. But here is the, the where I remind you. And I encourage you to read that psalm, sing it if you can. But don't forever forget the aim of that song. The aim of the song is to teach so that the faith of the next generation will be established. You, your faith, and the next generation faith will be established for the glory of God and His name. That brings me to the second part before I give you the challenge. The dream that we're not just living for ourselves, but now looking ahead to prepare for the next generation church. The dream, for me at least, is something that I would reflect just as the psalmist did in Psalm 9-1. The psalmist wrote, I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount, I will remember, I will retell all of your wonderful deeds. So I'm here to tell you what God has done amazingly for this church, the history of this church, and in my life. Why have we reached a point this morning that I'm standing here before you about to give you a challenge of faith on how we can prepare for the next generation? The dream started on November 2015 for this building. This is a notebook that was on my table as I was on a mountain having my own spiritual retreat. This is a notebook. This is a four-year-old notebook. It was November of 2015. I drew here drawings. I, I, made, I wrote here notes on how on what the Lord had impressed upon me upon my return to propose on where we we're going to go as a church. And it's not me because my dream didn't come from me. I believe it comes from God. And my dream did not start with me. I am only one of those who are carrying on the dream that has been started by others. So the dream doesn't start with me and doesn't end with me. This dream doesn't start with us and ends with us. But this is a dream that we can dream together. In year 2015, I, in November, I, I, I drew this. I'm not a talented artist, but I drew this. I imagined what we will look like in the next years that will come. That this is Gusat Highway and this is the, the coast, the, the, the sea. 
that there would rise a tall building on the back. And the purpose of that building would primarily be this. The building will be built so that the next generation will be taught. The next generation will be reached. It will be a building that will be a, a, a training facility, a, a, leadership, uh, a factory of leaders, a factory of missionaries, a factory of ministers that would come out from this place having being equipped fully in the ministry grounded towards maturity that was a dream way back four years ago and not only that i imagine how how amazing it would be that if we would have a a worship hall on the, on the top for the young younger people and then they would see the the, the sea and, and as well as offices or um uh, function rooms wherein wider group could celebrate life events, and they would have this wonderful view uh, that would just be in, in uh, well, I've, I lost the word. Uh, it would complement, there, it would complement everything that we've been doing here to advance God's kingdom. That, those would be the facilities. So I imagine classrooms, I imagine uh, training facilities, and Amazing, amazing report. I report to you just as Psalm 91. I'm, I'm, I'm so amazed by God here that and four years ago, I drew in this. This is the stage where I'm standing before you guys. And on the back, I wrote, this would be a great way to put up a bookstore. And we have, lo and behold, we have the tool shed. Why is it there? Because books are amazing teachers. Books are equippers. And, and we have the, that, that now, and this was written four years ago. It's amazing how God can give us a dream. But see, this is a dream that is not my dream. This is a dream that is His. I'm not like Joseph the dreamer here. I'm like, I'm, the, I'm David the dream catcher. I want to follow King David's example. I want to I wanna catch God's dream, and I don't just want to catch God's dream, but I also want to be a dream mover. I want to do something with this dream. So, so 2009, the dream didn't start in 2015. The dream started in 2009 when elders of this church approached me and said, would you like to lead the, the, the young minist uh, youth ministry, right? and I amazed myself. God really moved in my life at that moment and said, I said, I'll pray about it, and I said yes. And, and here, and 10 years ago, the hub, if you can remember, the hub used to look like this. It was, you'd take a bath, you'd go there in the morning, and, and you'd be drenched in sweat. In this weather, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you go there, even if you've taken a bath, you're, you're going to be drenched in sweat. It was so hot there. It was dusty and all. And yet, young people would go there, 40 of them, each Sunday. And yet, when, when, when the elders said, would you like to lead a team? And God had prepared already, God's preparation, that I had 20 young professionals with me. We were serving a ministry for sharing the gospel to urban poor kids. There was 20 of us that said, yes, we're going to go and help the young people, uh, the youth here. And, and we went. And that was on June two, 7. So four, five months later, four months later, uh, we helped and launched Inside Out. It was formerly known as Gen Y. In June 7, 2009, we launched Inside Out. The place looked so different from what it used to be. And, and none of us, had experience in choosing tiles or curtains. I don't have experience in setting up lights, but I would just meet a rainfort. I would just meet people that, would, uh, that God would just lead and, and it would, they would just help amazingly. And so the story goes that uh, from a 40 weekly, uh, young people going in the hub, Sunday in and Sunday out, we grew to a uh, 100 over almost 100 or 200 overnight. And it didn't stop there. Two years later, it, uh, we went to the city and it became Inside Out City. And we were able to, this was, this was just a rooftop, by the way. And once again, God 
just prepared everything. I would meet this person and this person would have the gift of designing and I would say, hey, can you help me? And then this person would say, yeah, sure. Uh, could you do it for free, please? And then the person would say, sure, oh, amazing. And so what happens is that uh, this came out. And, and this could fit at one point for, uh, 400 young people. And it, the Lord didn't stop there. In 2011, uh, we, on 2015, God uh, brought me to Manila for my formal training. I went there for my seminary training. And for three years, I was there, 2015 to 2018. But here's what I, uh, well, the situation that um, on July 12, 2015, when I arrived there, GCAF Metro Manila, our, our daughter church was there. They were, they were uh, two years old. And this is, this is the room. Basically, there's three uh, monoblock chairs here. One, two, three. A very thin alleyway. And th another three monoblock chairs here. And it will just be composed of 10 rows. So 30. 30 people in one small narrow room. That's July. On September, God led us to a bigger place. We transferred. In just two months, we were able to uh, connect with a contractor, a designer. I, I, I gave like all these things. And then, uh, so God wasn't true with what I had to do, right? To build and to design and to, to make things. And, and so this happened. Now, they just celebrated their uh, anniversary last September 15, and there's a lot of them now. It's amazing. And now, the place, the place that we're sitting on, Warren Buffet said, someone is sitting in the shade today, enjoying the shade of a beautiful tree, because someone planted a tree long time ago. The dream didn't start with me. 1987, two men, two men got the dream from God. And they said, we're going we're gonna to step up in faith. We're going to plant a church in Gusa. Two men, Pastor Ruben Ang and my dad, Pastor Alonzo Chong. 1987, 32 years ago. Why are we enjoying this shade, this wonderful place? Two men along with 50 people stepped out in faith and said, we're going to go out in faith and we're going to prepare. We're going to build for the next generation. And they did. And here we are, 32 years later, in a place we can say we've now outgrown. We need a facility that would help us now reach Cagayan de Oro in a way because Cagayan de Oro has changed so much from 32 years ago. And that would come a day, there would come a day too, that there would come a day that our children's children would say, hey, thank you, Lolo, thank you, uh, great granddad, but it's time as well for us to now build for the next generation. But it's our time, it's our turn, it's our turn to plant. It's our turn to build. And so I leave you with that very encouraging because think about it. How did you come to know God? How did you grow up in this local family? It has been made possible by God because God gave the dream. And, and men and women caught it. And they didn't stop by just keeping it for themselves. They moved with the dream. They became dream movers. Now it's our time. It's our turn. Let's watch this video. I remember what the Bible says about giving whoever so sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever give generously will also reap generously and each of us should give 
according to what our hearts decided to give. Not reluctantly, but uh, joyfully because uh, God loves a cheerful giver. Um, aside from um, the unspeakable joy of giving, um, when I give, uh, I know that uh, I am allowing God to develop um, a character in me. And uh, uh, I see to it that it is my act of worship and obedience to the Lord. I know that God is glorified with it. For me, is to uh, encourage people to be positive, expressing gratitude, and then nindut kaayo siya kay makahatag o kalipay sa ako ang kasing-kasing. And then more a blessing nga akong na-experience na kung ikaw maghatag, uh, God will give you more of blessings nga wala pa gini mo na-experience. I believe every time we give uh, to the Lord cheerfully, joy is the natural fruit that comes, uh, that flows within us. So I believe that is the one thing that uh, every believer can benefit from, from giving when you obey the Lord in giving to Him cheerfully. When I give, it's, it's just a little act that I make, not for myself, not for others, but always for the glory of God. To give in faith means entrusting to the Lord whatever it is that you're offering Him. When I give, I always think po na kung mga anak, akong mga grandchildren will enjoy the money na akong ihatag karon for the future generation. So kung maghatag ko for the building, I don't know when this will be built, kaning atong jikap karon ang building. I don't know, maybe I'll, I won't be here anymore. Namahuman ang kuan, di natin baban ang, ang atong kaugmaon, but I am so sure magamit ko sa next generation. Giving in faith is, is like uh, always thinking that even, of, even if how small the gesture that you make, you always think that uh, the act of giving is always big in, in the eyes of God and that every act of giving, we must always do it cheerfully and with a, with a cheerful heart. For me, to give in faith means to, that you are acknowledging and you are uh, declaring that uh, even the capacity to give and the means by which you can give does not come from yourself, but it comes from the Lord. And uh, you are just uh, His uh, instrument in which uh, that, uh, you can uh, give to Him whatever He has uh, blessed you and trusted you with. When I give in faith, it is to acknowledge God that He is the source of everything. Nothing I can uh, keep to myself. Um, when we, we give to God, uh, allowing Him that uh, He is the, the He is the God who multiplies. You no, know, whatever we put in His hand uh, for His glory. Christian ka, you should automatically when you get born again. One of the kaning virtues na ibotang sa ginoo sa ato is the gift of giving. Di na ka ingon na kuripot. Di na ka ingon na kagang. Di na manghatag always thinking of yourself. So it is so important na di lang ako but kitang tanan ang maghatag. Di lang isa. Ang, ang 100, remember, 100 pesos, it starts with 20 pesos. So if you don't have that 100 pesos, you can give 20 or 10 pesos. Ano ba so we all have this privilege to give. Kitang tanan, gitagahan ta sa ginoo. This privilege to give because in the future, when we face Christ sa iyang judgment seat of Christ, muabot na diha ang kanang si Pablo ng hatag o ginana. So natay mga reward ana. So just think of the rewards in the future. Mao kana siya ang Dapat kitang tanan mang hatan. But dapat from the 
ka ng cheerful giver ang gusto yun sa ginoo sa ato. Not force. You should give na dili ka give force. When you are being forced, then think of ko an ingon ni mo next time na magkatan. When you are very cheerful. I believe that every member of the body of Christ is uh, called by God to take part in whatever the church is doing, whether today or for the future. So much has been given to me, to my family, to my marriage, spiritually, emotionally, physically, even in, in, the, in, in terms of finances. And um, I cannot afford to stop just like a river from flowing, I want others to benefit from that blessing also. So I give so that others also are able to give to others. I am investing for the next generation church because I believe and trust in God's vision for all of us Christians. Being in the children's ministry, I can, I can see the, the seriousness of losing the next generation if we allow it to happen. I know it's not enough that uh, we are called Christians or a Christian who disciples, but it is also important to see the next generation uh, becoming Christian or to become a Christian and a Christian disciples. Uh, in this, uh, I know I am investing for me to see the next generation to be in, in depth uh, in, their, in their knowledge of who God is. Um, the counsel of who God is, a God who saves and who satisfies their hearts. Kinahanglan gid kita magtinabagay as one big family, as a church. Aron ma-preserve na to ang next generation of the youth and continue the legacy of faith through helping build the next generation church. Aron mapadayon na to ang bulaton sa Ginoo nga kita nga naa karon diri as a steward of Christ nga kinahanglan nga magpadayon maglihok magtinabangay aron ipakita nga sa umaabot natong mga anak nga sila magpadayon ug makaila sa Ginoo I believe that I am called and all the other believers are also called to participate participate in uh, this endeavor of the church to prepare for the next generation church. As a husband, as a father, and as a steward of whatever God has entrusted to me, uh, I believe that this is uh, part of my uh, expressing to God you know, my gratitude for what He has been doing in my life. And this is uh, one way of simply uh, telling God that uh, I am grateful for what you are doing in my life, what you are doing for the church, and I believe in what the church is doing in preparing for the next generation. Because as a mother, it is my desire to see my children, their friends, and all the kids here in church to grow, to see them grow spiritually and lead others to Christ and make disciples. Others should take part in building the next generation church simply because we are family. Don't families help each other whether in good or bad times, diba? And as part of the current generation, it's our moral duty to contribute in God's plan for our future brothers and sisters. It has been said that it takes uh, a church to raise a child. We as a church, um, we are God's plan A. There is no plan B. <laughs> and uh, we need to work together as a church for this seeing the size of the task it requires it requires everyone it is it is too too great to be alone in this we need each other to give our part i know this is a long journey but at least at least uh it started in us no? today it started in us in me and in you Can I go back to the slides, uh, 2015, the proposal, and to show you what we are building so that you would have an idea what we have passed uh, through. Uh, can you skip towards the, the designs? And so 2015, December, we proposed to the elders, and the elders 
approve of the, the dream. It became a shared dream to the, the leaders of this church. And we have now passed like five designs already in the course of starting from 2015 to 2019. Uh, the, the GCAF master plan or the, the GCAF development master plan has been uh, for several years in the making. We have this previous designs. We realized that uh, we've been going back to praying to God and Lord, wh- how do you want us to build for the next generation that would be ready to equip and train uh, people, saints, Lord, for, for your glory. And so finally on June of 11, no, no, uh, September 22, last week's, uh, two weeks ago, there was a meeting. This was now the, the output of that meeting, and the fifth design proposal came to be that it would now be this. This is a, an eight-story building that would now be housed on the back of this lot. So that means from here on the highway side until that that part of that portion would be here, the entrance, and it would be parking space. We would start our building or the, the room, the worship hall would be starting on the second floor because we realize parking is so important that we don't want parking to be a reason that people would say or would put the name of God in disdain. And so we said we want to be good stewards of what God has given us, maximize everything, uh, even parking, so that it will just be according on what our space. So here, this hall would be housing 1,000 people. If you can imagine with me, this is 400. 400 of you are sitting here on the, on the ground floor. That's our capacity. And on the, uh, on, the, on the mezzanine, there's up to 80 of you that can fit there. So at a, at a given time, 480 people could be here at maximum capacity. This place would give us a few e- more years where before we could get filled, room, plenty of room to grow. And the, the third floor or the fourth floor, basically, would be where our kids will be taught about God. And this would be our Sunday school classrooms and classrooms later on during the, during the week. And the fourth floor would be the, the function rooms, multi-purpose rooms, where it can be used for meetings, for seminars, workshops, etc. And this uh, seventh, seventh floor, I think, would be, eighth floor would be the, the worship hall, a, a multi-purpose hall, high ceiling as well, where the youth can once again worship if they so, uh, Lord willing, would uh, permit. And the, the top part, so this would be the design and if you're facing the coastal highway, uh, it would be the, this, uh, and this, is, this photo was taken on the third floor of this C building, the building on our back behind us. And I took this picture in an afternoon to show you what, it's gonna, what we're going to look like. Half of this lot will be occupied by the building. And if we're at second floor, the, the first floor would be parking, and there would be, because of the foundation, the architect and the, const- uh, the engineers told us, we could also have a basement parking for free. Basically, just put up the walls and there would be a two-level parking for us. And with that, there would be two phases. Phase one would be the worship hall and the kids' uh, facilities or classrooms. After that, phase two would start. And we could start worship there and we could start our kids, have our kids there. And on the upper floors, they would continue construction and there would be the training rooms, function rooms, and the multi-purpose hall will be built there. So imagine that there would be classrooms such as these, uh, just concept designs, but, you know, conducive environments for us to learn and teach one another. And, and there would be offices, uh, conference rooms, meeting rooms. There would be uh, Sunday school rooms. We would really design the place that we would have family in mind different seasons of family in mind to come and worship with us. And, and there would be multifunction rooms. If you're a wider group, you're celebrating life, or you're celebrating uh, one uh, milestones in life, we could have uh, a conducive area for you to, to celebrate and live life together, to journey life together. That's why we're all about journeying life together, journey with GCAF. And uh, on the eighth floor, on the rooftop, a rooftop uh, if somebody would say, I want to follow Lord, uh, the, the, the Lord in water baptism. 
we would have a small pool that would you know, be facing the sea and uh, we could have uh, witnesses there. We could celebrate life together, even be, uh, a person that comes to the Lord and follows Him in declaring publicly His faith in water baptism. We'd have a place for barbecue and all that would be there. So everything is now complementary to what we are doing. Uh, that's what we need, want. And this is the design. And I now turn the mic to Jay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I had a friend when I was 10 years old. My best friend, his name is Philip. Um, yeah, if I would uh, think of what we have done, I would, it would you know, put a smile on my face. It was just a wonderful time for me. During that time, uh, our favorite game was to play soldier because we were located west of Mindanao where helicopters would often come and war tanks would always pass by our place because of a certain war in the mountains. We loved to play soldiers and um, we would uh, crawl to muddy places, jump towards um, grassy uh, lands. And when I would go home, my dad would often tell me why I smell like a carabao. Um, but one of the uh, things that um, probably I have gifted, gifted him with, that I still remember up until now, because his family was not a follower of Jesus, one of the be best things I, I did for him was to invite him to church. One day I invited him to church. I had the courage to invite him to church. And he, indeed, he came together with his older sister and his little brother. And I will never forget that. We had so many experiences, but that was the only time that I still vividly remember up until now. Now, why am, why am I telling you this? Because I, um, you know, I have also a dream that one day my son and daughter would invite their best friends to church and um, I you know my heart tells me to also be there for them during that time uh, to invest for that time when they would invite their friends to come and not just investing on a building because as Matthew would say uh, it is a place where moth and rust would come and destroy but investing in, in an eternal investment of equipping and teaching that I would be secure that the best friend of my son and my daughter will get to know Jesus Christ the moment they would invite or they, they would invite them to church. Now this morning, I want you to invest like me. My box is already there. It may be small, but the Lord... I know the Lord will bless um, the, you know, the heart of a believer who is generous in giving uh, something, offering something to the Lord. I want you to invest of something wherein the return will, may not be uh, directly experienced by you or me. It's an investment wherein the result uh, will be experienced by the next generation. I don't want you to also invest not only for a building, but invest for an opportunity and an environment for teaching and equipping and the preaching of the gospel for the next generation. With you, um, in your uh, program, there's this photo paper uh, printed here is some blanks wherein you can fill out your name, the commitment that you will give, whether it's monthly or yearly commitment or uh, other commitment. It could be a one-time giving that you would give to the church for the building or it could be your 13th month. I heard somebody saying that he'll give, give his 13th month. I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, you can put it here and the amount, that certain yearly or monthly amount that you will give and you put here the month with which you will start giving, if it's monthly, uh, the starting month within you would give. 
And on the white part, this part, you just copy whatever it is that you wrote here. And part of this is a checkbox wherein if you, you know, like me, you would often forget. Just put a check mark on this if you want to be reminded of your commitment through text. And if you are uh, making a check, please make the checks payable to GCAF. And after which, you tear the paper, uh, the white part, you put it on the box that will be provided here in front. And the black part will be for you. You put it in your wallet. You put it in your prayer room for you to continue to pray and be reminded of the commitment that you will give uh, right now. Before you will do that, uh, I will be praying for you. And um, as you would come later, there will be people up there in the back. If you don't have ball pens, you can get ball pens from them and start writing. And you come here in front, drop the white part here at the box, and then you go to that certain small boxes. You put your names there, and as a symbol of the building, you put the box here in the, this, I don't know what do you call this, the symbol of our building, you know? Uh, example, let me have an example na lang faith. Can I have a box? Yeah. So you, block is a block. So you put your name here and then you put this block here and there are so many names already written here. It's a symbol of our commitment to the Lord uh, and as you continue to look at this, you will be reminded that I have a monthly or a yearly commitment to the Lord. Okay, so let me pray for all of us. Let us all stand and let us pray. Father, I pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to us at this moment. Lord, we have experienced so many blessings coming from you. Blessings after blessings in different areas of our lives. Part of that, Lord, is also in our finances. You have stewarded us with so many things. Yet you also told us to give cheerfully, generously to you. I pray that this would be an area that you would move through us that generosity would well up upon us and we will invest not for ourselves but for our children for our children's children that they would experience also the love of God this beautiful knowledge that we have of the Lord Jesus Christ that we may teach them we may have an avenue and an opportunity to teach them, to equip them so that they can also teach in the future, preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and proclaim to the ends of the earth of your goodness, of your grace, and of your mercy. I pray that we will commit to this generously. For some of us, Lord, who have not yet decided and could not decide for now, I pray that as they would go to their houses, you'd continue to speak to them and they may also commit and give for you in the coming days. We ask all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Uh, ball pens are there at the back. You can go and start writing now in your papers and uh, after you're done, please come. Come here. There are uh, ushers. Our beautiful ushers will teach you on how to do it. Thank you so much. Go ahead.
come here in front and uh, get your blocks. Put here your white paper. This one. You can also sew now in cash uh, or in checks. Make it payable to GCAF. You can put it here. Praise the Lord for that. Come. Come. From those upstairs, you can also come down uh, and put on the white paper here in front. Some of you are not ready for now. You can drop this on the offering box next week or maybe you are still praying after we have our closing prayer after this you can still uh, have a time of prayer with the Lord and uh, we will still place this box here and you can put the, um, the white part this one, the box after our gathering praise the Lord Everybody to please stand. Let us all stand. Let's come to the Lord. Let us bow down our heads. And um, again, after our closing prayer, you can still come. You know, um, some of you probably are a bit shy to come here in front. But after the closing prayer, you can still come and um, do these things. These uh, beautiful ushers will still be here. To usher you, if you have questions, you can come. Some of you have questions about the building. You can approach our elders, see David. You can um, uh, ask people about different questions that you have. No, so let us bow down our heads and let me pray for all of us. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to give. Opportunity to be a part of your vision. Opportunity, Lord, not just to build a building, but to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ through this building. Pray, Father, that you would continue to pour out your blessings upon each one of us in different areas, most especially also, Lord, in our businesses, finances that we need every day. And in, with this, Lord, also the spiritual blessing 
that we need for us to realize that all of these material things that we have are not only for our own consumption, but you have given all of this as a steward, as us being stewards for your glory to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ here in Gusak and in Cagayan de Oro City. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. And as we leave this place, I pray that the love of the Father, the grace and the mercy of His Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship and the anointing of the Holy Spirit be with us all, be upon us all, now and forevermore. Amen and amen.